no, no, no. It's been like two weeks. Dude. Live streams. Caught me off guard, man. You realize we're going. <laughs> all right, all right. All right. What's up, YouTube? Yeah. It is Kalkwasser Day. Uh, and I can't wait for today because it was like, you know, like, uh, I don't know, calcium and alkalinity day last time. Yeah. And or... Kalkwasser was like what everybody wanted to talk about. <laughs> today, man, we're diving in. I actually uh, had a really cool t call with Luca yesterday. We'll share some of that stuff. Oh, today. yeah. I went and uh, watched the, all of those live streams from him and Telegram and uh, all Reef Dudes and those three, those two. Learned a lot. Learned, Learned a lot. You know what I thought about actually today? Is it's Kelkwasser. It's like, I mean, this is like the first thing I've ever used to, to maintain calcium, milk, lean, maintain. Yeah. 20 years, man, like, or gluten cold going, getting close to. Coming Still back. Still learn something <laughs> new every day. About Kelkwasser. I mean, like, every day you learn something new. But today, if you don't learn something new today, man, I don't know, you weren't paying attention. So uh, today, man, Kelkwasser. This is off of, yeah, this is off of episode 30 of our uh, 52 weeks of reefing. Uh, the title, I didn't have it written down here, but it's something about Kalkwasser. It's like pH, alkalinity, calcium in one solution. Oh, and uh, we always start these things because today, man, that was 2015. It's now 2022. Yeah. Uh, what has changed about the world. Kalkwasser? I mean, you would almost think nothing, but it's, it's not cal true. <laughs> it's calcium hydroxide. No, there's a lot that's been changed. A uh, whole bunch of things, man. The way that we think about it, the way that people use it, uh, it is uh, absolutely changed. But here is the core belief. And I bet you some of the people watching today are going to agree with this one. And other people are going to say, you know, WTF. Yeah. Uh, all right. So... <laughs> Uh, core belief, I'll let you say it. Uh, the core belief, uh, our core belief about Kalkwasser is that Kalkwasser is the most underappreciated additive that there, is, that there is. It's just nobody really appreciates the true value of Kalkwasser. I've and had this conversation. I think, well, I think that now that, uh, you know, this conversation of uh, pH, specifically in our circles that we talk in, uh, it's becoming more and more of a popular talking point than down the hydroxides of the world that have like double the pH boosting power uh, are starting to come back to the forefront of people's minds. You know, it's funny because I've had this conversation many times mm. and, uh, you know, over beers at a show or whatever. And like I mentioned my love affair with Kelkwasser and I get kelk shamed. Uh, and they're like, what is wrong with you? Why would you do use that dinosaur solution? Okay, so today you're gonna hear why, like I think it's probably, I'm gonna go out and say, I mean, there really isn't a best for everything. That's one of the things you're gonna learn today, but like mm. it is one of the better solutions for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, all right, and you're gonna hear what matters most is the next segment. Uh, but later on, we'll hit some of the hard lessons. Yes. Uh, we're also gonna hit the four ways to use it and some information on uh, you know who's the right person for each type of way. Uh, but what matters most? The first one here is hydroxides raise the pH better than any other mm. uh, alkalinity additive. And I realize it's calcium <laughs> and alkalinity, but it's sodium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide. And some people are using potassium hydroxide, but oh, really? I've, I've, nah, I didn't test that in my last Investigates test. Interesting, but I haven't heard that one. Nah, I mean, it's kind of fringe right now. Fringe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, fringe means it'll pop to the surface <laughs> and uh, the thought leaders or trailblazers yeah. will uh, try it out for us. But again, it's a hydroxide. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you guys saw last week's uh, Investigates video on Wednesday, uh, we tested what, it t what the pH change was when you take all of these different additives, soda, ash, bicarbon, and the hydroxides, and you dose a tank enough to raise the DKH by one alkal or by one DKH by or raise the alkalinity, uh, what happens to the pH? Both sodium hydroxide or lye and calcium hydroxide uh, raised it by. It was 0.4. Yeah, by 0.4 or something like that. Pretty, yeah, pretty heavy. Like soda ash was like 0.2, most of them. Yep. Uh, so yep. like double the increase in pH using uh, calcium hydroxide versus like soda ash and, and calcium mm -hmm. chloride. Mm -hmm. So a uh, big, big thing for, and we've been talking about pH forever, you know, go back and watch that episode because that one's like two hours long, but you'll learn more than you ever knew. Uh, but really it will change the trajectory of your tank. It'll, it'll decrease mortalities. You'll grow to coral faster. Mm. Uh, it'll be more stable, but uh, 
Uh, another reason why calcium hydroxide is uh, popular, or I think one of the best solutions out there, is it's safer than sodium hydroxide. Yeah, so. there's still there's still some warnings about calcium hydroxide. Definitely don't like inhale it. I think Luca is talking about you know when he makes his caulk slurry, he actually has like gloves that go up to here, and he wears a respirator and things like that. But mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, again like when you go read the CDC warnings for sodium hydroxide or lye, okay. it gets pretty rough. So two part will uh, and sodium hydroxide will hit next week, I think, or or, uh, or next episode, mm -hmm. I think it is. Uh, but uh, one of the things that's uh, changed about the mentality of using uh, Kalkwasser for a lot of people is there's ways now to peg the concentration and dose it as accurately as two part. Mm. So, you know, I'm a dinosaur. So back when uh, uh, Kalkwasser was introduced to me the first time, it was throw it in your auto top off. Man, you're managing salinity, yeah. you're managing uh, pH, you're managing uh, calcium and alkalinity, like the four major things, and, and even uh, top off water, like uh, all in one solution. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know what? I mean, it worked. Yeah. I had my problems with it. It overdosed in my tank because like a float valve was uh, For your my ATO. failure point. Yep. Yeah. But. You know, the biggest problem was is you couldn't really get a consistent dose out of well, it. So summertime, it's evaporating more. Wintertime, it's not so much. And now your evaporation rates change, which means your uh, your high, your your Kalkwasser dosing rates change. Mm -hmm. uh, there was that whole conversation of like, oh, you know, do a, a quarter of a teaspoon or a half a teaspoon or a one teaspoon to mix different concentrations uh, other than max saturation and. Uh, it's just a heck of a lot easier now uh, outside of the ATO. Uh, so uh, another one on here is, uh, so yeah, like may pegging that concentration, just mix up the lime just water. Go max saturation. Actually, there's some other ways to do it. We'll share in a minute mm -hmm. too. But you can mix up a, a stable concentration and then use a dosing pump to dose the same amount every day, no different than anything else. Let your ATO do its ATO thing and mm -hmm. then just do dose Kalkwasser. The ATO is light duty now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, uh, Kalkwasser, uh, one of the other things that matters most we found is Kalkwasser is not all the same, uh, both in the data and in the physical attributes, you know, so we added the pharma along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I'll share why we did the pharma in just a second. Uh, but uh, along the way, we added the pharma. So physical attributes of it, uh, you know, calc is generally like really telky. Like talcum powder poof. Yeah. yeah poof. You mm -hmm. know, uh, yeah. and like you breathe it, it goes in mm -hmm. the air. Uh, whereas the pharma stuff is generally a free flowing powder. Reminds me of powdered sugar. Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah. But it doesn't like go into the air and you don't like breathe it the same way. Yeah. Uh, but uh, also you can see it in the data. We sent those things out to ICP, MS. I forgot I was going to get a slide for this. Oh, yeah. At the, end, uh, uh, at the end of today's episode, we'll link you to that uh, Kalkwasser. We did ICP, MS testing. We spent like 20 grand to test a whole array of chemicals. Kalkwasser and all the additives uh, were, was one of them the data results for what is in those. This is, IC, uh, this is ICP MS testing, so this is beyond your our aquarium ICP tests. Uh, so we tested uh, like other aquarium bulk brands, we tested aquarium brands, we tested uh, like Mississippi Lime, uh, we tested uh, 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 Mrs. Wages. Mrs. Wages, like stuff you buy at the store. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we also even calculated how much the stuff costs, uh, yeah. you know, for an average person's use. You know, you can get some data in there. Uh, but it was really surprising because the stuff that, uh, you know, the poofy, telky stuff, you know, has had like 2,200 parts per million. Silica. Uh, silica like Versus maybe like, what's that, I'm butchering this, but like 40 parts or 400 parts per million uh, all of them, aluminum. All of them had arsenic uh, in the parts per billion. Uh, but I think the, like, the pharma grade was you know, almost two times, three times I think it was lower. as much as seven. I think uh, the pharma had 0 0.1 parts per million, mm. and some of the other ones had 0 0.7, yeah, which is yeah, seven yeah. times as much. So all of them have some impurities in it. So uh, physical properties, uh, whether you want to breathe or not, there are, there are differences. The point uh, is that they're all not the same. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I'm going to actually go way back. I'll give you the story of, of why we did pharma. So I think maybe... I don't know, maybe it's interesting. <laughs> uh, so back in the day, uh, I was introduced to uh, Mississippi Lime, mm -hmm. right? You go buy a 50 pound bag of this stuff. I went and found an industrial supplier willing to sell it to me, bought this stuff. I had kelp, you know, for the rest of my life. Yeah. Uh, and 
Uh, when it came time to build BRS, you know, we started on magnesium, calcium, and all other stuff, and somebody said, why don't you sell bulk calcium? I uh, like a couple of the manufacturers in the world, uh, the aquarium said, hey, dude, you should just get Mississippi Lime. That's what we use. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, well, that's the stuff I was using, too, for years, and oh, that's, I guess. <laughs> you know, and so, uh, you know, not everybody had a source for that stuff. And, and just looking at the data in the IMS testing, I would be surprised if they all weren't using uh, just the same Mississippi, Mississippi lime. lime. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, you put a fish sticker on the front and the get price it, goes way up. <laughs> get it in bulk, repackage, and put a fish sticker. I, I wouldn't be surprised. But when the time came, man, and like you, you if anybody's been watching Beers Evolve over the years, you saw different mm -hmm. approaches to things. Yep. And uh, in the end, it's like, well, why are we just repackaging this Mississippi lime? Somebody else can do that, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Let's go after something better, uh, purer, safer, uh, easier to measure, uh, and make it and still make it affordable. Yeah, make it affordable, a different quality for people that want to use it, uh, and you know, not it's not the right solution for everyone. You mm -hmm. know, uh, and I think you'll find some of the people later on will share who it isn't the right solution for, specifically like super high demand users. Like mm -hmm. most people, the difference is two bucks a month. Uh, yeah. For some people, it might be, uh, you know, I don't know, man, 50 bucks a month if yeah. you're like got a thousand gallon tank and you're, <laughs> you know, dumping uh, tons and tons of it a day. But, uh, you know, you kind of got to figure out who you are in that matrix. Mm. Uh, but now you know the story of uh, <laughs> where <laughs> a pharma came from, actually. So for those of you who don't know, uh, the pharma that we use, we actually hit up uh, a supplier that uh, makes the stuff in the United States and its primary purpose is actually baby formula. Mm. So it is a totally different standard than, you know, pickles. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, and actually the reason that it's so low aluminum is it's literally low aluminum grade pharma, oh, uh, you know, okay. USP grade yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff. Uh, so that's why it's low aluminum. Mm. Can't have all aluminum in a baby formula. Uh, all right. So uh, another thing, though, that people love Kelkwasser. This is one that I think that people don't appreciate enough, but it doesn't raise salinity. Calcium hydroxide goes in the water. Calcium, boom, splits off, does calcium stuff. Boom, hydroxide pops off, reacts with the carbon dioxide in the tank, turns into carbonate alkalinity. There's nothing residual. Uh, oh, and that's why it has one of the biggest pH boosts, too, because it's seeking out all that CO2 in your uh, mm -hmm. water to... Reducing carbonic to, acid. Yeah, so... Um, but, you know, when you... It's that common thing. I guess if it, with a really good water change regimen, you probably won't see the salinity increase. But over time, you know, you're dosing two part, you're dosing two part. There's still some sodium, and there's still some chloride left over, uh, and that's salt. And so over time, salinity just increases. I mean, in your sodium chloride, or in your calcium chloride and sodium bicarbonate, there's quite a bit of sodium chloride yeah. uh, between those. And if you're just even the mag Well, even the magnesium, so mag oh. uh, yeah, so. Magnesium chloride mm -hmm. has a lot in there too? Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, you probably dose that either way though, with your Kelkwasser. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, with the uh, uh, sodium chloride from the two part, we'll explore that in the two part episode, but the reality is, is if you're just dosing a normal amount that most people would use, it's not going to have that big of an effect on salinity. Mm. But if you got wall-to-wall -wall coral, kind of like what you're seeing behind us, uh, dude, the salinity is going to rise, and you're going to have to lower this, uh, uh, reduce it uh, by diluting the tank. You dilute the tank, all not just salinity goes down, but all the elements go down, and it becomes a seesaw problem. Yeah, but yeah. Kelp water, no. You add calcium, you add hydroxide, no salinity problem. <laughs> uh, so, you know, oh, we've we're got a theme here going, hey, this stuff is actually pretty cheap. It's a single product, single dosing pump. Uh, it doesn't mess with your salinity and it raises the pH better than everything else out there. It's starting to fit the bill of Kelk Washer's the most underappreciated additive there is, right? Yeah, the only, the only difference is, is the, uh, the limit, like, to yes. what you can dose in a single day. Well, there are various ways to get around that yeah, limit. Yeah, there is. Uh, okay, uh, and yeah, I, we mentioned here, one of the lowest ongoing or media costs. So uh, it can be fairly inexpensive to set up. Again, you don't need as many dosing pumps, well, and the, the material itself is pretty inexpensive. Yeah, at the time that we did the, that we did the Kalkwasser investigates with the ICPMS testing, there were aquarium brand one, aquarium brand two, there's like Brightwell, and then there's us. Now these are, 
the Kalkwas are, th these are like well-known brands. We just didn't name them except for Brightwell wanted to be named in the, in the test. Oh, yeah, um, uh, and I'll let you know one too. The bulk one was actually Doctors Fosters and Smith. Uh, oh yeah, I share that because they don't exist anymore. <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, but yeah. the you know when we when you at the time the the cost per you know uh, I think we did you did it in a month like the cost for a month's worth of this stuff uh, like a dollar twenty something. Uh, twenty. We were uh, it's it, the the progression was like a dollar fifty, dollar sixty, dollar forty, dollar twenty, like a dollar something else, and then there's the Mrs. Wages at forty cents a month, and then like if you get a big bulk fifty pound bag of Mississippi lime, you're talking like five cents a month. You know, like the funny part is, is like that's eighty cents. Like I might cost me 80 cents to drive to the store to go find I'd have to go to four stores to find Mrs. Wages <laughs> <laughs> and taxes on that depending on where you live too like if I yeah. buy a bulk amount of Mrs. Wages I, I probably got, just paid my 80 cents in I tax. got 80 cents of aluminum along the way as well <laughs> uh, all right so uh, now here is the meat of it this is the part I'm sure a lot of people are waiting for mm. is there's four ways to use Kelkwasser and I'm gonna say it straight I think there are four distinct people or reefers that would value each way or be best for each way yeah. depending on like what type of tank you have the size of it what's in it uh, and so I'll, I'll share the four ways and then we'll share you know which ways that you know we would like uh, or we would use ourselves mm -hmm. in, in those different uh, configurations uh, again there's no right or wrong tool here it's the right tool for the right job for the right person so I know we all kind of get like our uh, uh, defend our personal favorite way man but like this is the most important part to me and, it, and, and it's we need to not think about what we did for our own tanks it's Think about the person that's asking, because most of the time when we're talking about this, it is because somebody asked for counsel or advice, and we need to put on our thinking cap of, if, how can I help that person yeah. have the best result, the stablest result, the safest result, the thing that's gonna help them get where they wanna go, not necessarily where mm. I wanted to go. Yeah, if somebody was asking me for advice, it were the, she put myself in the, into those shoes, you know, like if this were my tank, like I had the exact same thing, like this is mine, this is Randy's now. Now, what advice would I give to myself uh, mm -hmm. for how to do it? All right, so first one mm -hmm. is the one that you're all familiar with, which is mix up the Kalkwasser with like two teaspoons uh, up to max saturation inside of a reservoir and then just let all the kelk settle out and then dose that like clearish liquid Saturated that comes on the top. Saturated lime water. Yep. Saturated lime water. Mm -hmm. uh, and use a doser. Don't use the ATO. Use a doser uh, and dose a consistent amount. That saturated kelk washer, as long as you have a fairly uh, a loose fitting lid, but you know, limit the amount of carbon dioxide that goes in there. The concentration of it is going to be very stable. Uh, you're going to be able to dose an accurate amount every single day. If your level is down, you'll be able to up it. One dosing pump. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I recommend this uh, as the best solution for anyone that has the space or doesn't have like a super duper high demand tank. Yeah, this is really easy. I think uh, for me, I had a 20 some gallon trash can on the other side of my reefing wall so that it was filled with caulk washer. Uh, then I had the space and I didn't run it on the dosing pump at that time, but you know, I had that, that space because I was running my ATO back then. But uh, you, it, doesn't, you know, it doesn't even have to, have to be a fancy dosing pump. Uh, you could do a uh, you know, BRS 1.1 1, 1 mil might be a little too slow, too slow. but the 50, uh, the 50 mil one per minute would be great. You yeah, know, especially put, put these things controller? on a timer, timer and a pH controller, yep. Uh, so, oh, I forgot, I was gonna share the four. So there's the max saturation reservoir doser. There's a max saturation uh, with a calc stirrer or reactor and a doser. Mm -hmm. There's the slurry reservoir and doser, and then there's a slurry reactor and doser. So we'll hit all four of those today, and they're different people for different things. Mm. But the reason that uh, I, I think that this here uh, with just that reservoir, if you have the space for it, and for me space meant that I just needed a week's worth of uh, top off for yeah. it, and I just get a little chest or footstool and put a container in it and put it next to the tank, and then I then had space for that reservoir. 
it was adequate uh, for my mixed tank, mm -hmm. a 90 gallon tank, and it was just fine. Uh, Easy to uh, move when you need to clean it. And it's not whatnot. super high demand. And I, Kelpester gets this weird rap, like uh, if only you have a low demand tank. It, You'd be really surprised how far just lime water take takes you. Take pretty far, yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I've seen some pretty impressive tanks that are only operating off of just lime water. And eventually you may find yourself uh, that it's not keeping up, uh, in which case you could add a fan to the tank if you want. Increase evaporation. Increase evaporation, which will allow you to dose more. And that's, by the way, that's the thing about this whole limiting uh, factor. Limiting factor, yeah. yeah. It's like, I can't dose more lime water than I have evaporation or the water's gonna go on the floor <laughs> uh, <laughs> eventually. So uh, that is your limiting factor. But this is why I really like this method for most people. Uh, it's the safest, uh, like it, the like physically the lime water. I, I don't know. I I never got burned by it or anything. I well, use it quite a bit. In most of the cases, you're putting on on a peristaltic dosing pump. So the chances of like on, other than your ATO that'll start a siphon or back yep. siphon or any one of those types of things, f floats failing in the on position, just not a factor here when you're using a dosing pump. It's pretty easy dosing pump and a pH controller of some kind. Like it, it's. It's going to be pretty, I wouldn't call it infallible, man, but it's, it's pretty, pretty safe. safe. Mm -hmm. And the chemical also, the lime water, I wouldn't tell you to put your hand in it per se, but I can tell you that I never got burned or anything. Mm. Like, so. Yeah. Uh, uh, it is uh, probably the easiest of the solutions we're going to talk today. And easy, by the way, means for you know intermediate to or beginner to intermediate reefers means you're going to be successful. Complex means you're probably not mm. uh, because the first time you try something complex, you usually mess it up. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know, man. If you find yourself outside of that, then feel free. Uh, it's also one of the cleanest solutions. It has the least amount of hardware and gear. It has consistent potency and it has the low lowest risk of impurities, even if you're using the most impure mm. of the kelk washers, the levels are going, or the, the nature of that super high pH solution is the impurities actually precipitate Settle out into the bottom. Mm. Yeah. So uh, for those reasons, I, I don't know, man, I, I'd love to hear what the community has to say, but like, if, if your demand doesn't exceed this method and you have a container near your tank uh, c capable of holding that, I don't know why you would add any more complexity than this. Mm -hmm. so like this is the right solution it's until easy. it's not. Okay, now uh, the next one here is the stirs and the uh, reactors of the world. Yeah, right? I'm going to predominantly be talking about stirs because the reactors I don't use all that often. But mm. okay, so if I don't have space next to this tank, meaning like I don't have a, a place to put a 10 gallon vat of water which kind of means I didn't have an ATO either. Uh, <laughs> uh, but if I didn't have that space, then the reactor, and I do have a place for a, a, a stir, well, this option becomes a little bit more attractive because you can fill up a whole bunch of uh, kelk washer in the bottom of your stir, mm -hmm. then pump water from wherever you need it through, through it. it. So that means I could run a dosing line like through my floor, through the wall, uh, through the mm -hmm. ceiling, through whatever I wanted, just along the baseboard in one of those little cord hiders or whatever to wherever the water is. And then using a, like a pump that's capable of going away as uh, the dose comes to mind, but you can dose you know, 30, 40 feet, uh, no problem. Take the water and push it through the kelk washer stir what you'll end up with is saturated lime water, as long as you do it slow enough, coming out the top and going in the tank, uh, and you'll have a consistent dose. And I don't have all of that water near the tank. We did this in the, in the ULMs. Yes. Uh, I've done it in a couple, I did it at home for a little while. I'll tell you why I stopped it in a second though. Yeah. This is a way to save on space. It's also, a way to feed the inner gear junkie if you have that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, when we had this one hooked up, you're talking about, you know, sending fresh water uh, through this reactor. I mean, this is kind of the basis of the uh, a vast marine caulkster is its gravity drain. So basically the water level stays right up into the edge of this little outlet. And when you sh push water through it, it just trickles out and trickles out into your tank. Um, 
but you know, for some people, it's like, well, how do I get the fresh water there? You know, is it uh, straight from my RODI, and did I open and close a solenoid? And one of the, the easiest ways that we did is you have an ATO reservoir already. You know, if you safely plumb your uh, RODI unit to your ATO reservoir uh, with float valves and you know all the other you know safety me uh, mechanisms, I can use I can one, use my ATO out of that reservoir, and two, draw water from it to go with a dosing pump to push through my caulkster. That's a good point that I missed, is that you can use that same ATO, can uh, ATO canister underneath your sump to feed both your ATO yep. as well as mm -hmm. the caulkster. Yeah, a ma major space saver. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, and in other cases too, is if you're going to do a different method, like maybe you ran a line just to and put it in a float valve into your sump. Yeah. Uh, we can put a little tiny uh, reservoir. Or if I needed two reservoirs, I didn't want to do that. Well, now the ATO reservoir can actually be really small because most of it's probably going to be made up by the Kelkwasser reservoir. Yep. Right. So. Uh, There's some challenges with this one though. Yeah. Okay. So. The reason that uh, uh, I guess I'd recommend this to a specific person would be if you didn't have the space, you're a total gear junkie, uh, and in theory you believe it's less maintenance because you can actually put a significant amount in a bigger one and you don't have to top it off with a new calc all that often. Mm. I said in theory for a reason. <laughs> uh, but I will tell you, in practice, with today's Kelkwasser stirrers, I haven't really found any of that to be true. I think the vast, the a vast one was their answer to that. You know, a lot of these stir bars and people, you know, we've ran into it. You know, people ran into it. You know, uh, for some of those stir bars, it wasn't a continuous motor to spin and and turn the caulk. It was uh, like hook it up to a, a timer or controller kick it on for X amount of minutes before I send water through the thing uh, and then kick it back off. But when you, when you allow the bar to sit there in a caulk, like slurry mountain of caulk down at the bottom, it just turns hard, it just solidifies. And then the bar can't even rotate. The Avast Marine uh, had a 24 hour continuous duty stirring on there, which is kind of like their answer to keep that stuff churning. Um, but still you're kind of, every once in a while, you'll, you'll run into the, like the bars jam. I found it. I found two problems with mine. One, I couldn't get enough in there to really save on the space and time without jamming the bar. Yeah, because the more you and, add, the harder it is for that bar to and, turn. And I also found that when it got below a certain point, then it would just turn to rock right underneath the bar. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And it just like I just. It was more monkeying around and more stuff to fail and more headache than it was worth. I had the whole thing set up, and then ultimately I was like, dude, I have a fish room here. Why don't I just fill up a reservoir over there and pull out of the reservoir? Because that doesn't fail. <laughs> it was just a total no-brainer for me. So I actually attempted the wrong solution for me when I should have done the first one, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, so... Another problem with this one, too, is that... Uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, the Avast Marine is the one I go to because we had it on the ULM, very mm -hmm. familiar with it. It had the, a probe port for like pH, and then you, it makes you think that why well, I can monitor, mm -hmm. you know, the concentration uh, based off of pH, and when pH starts to dip a little bit, I, I can see that I need to add more. Uh, a couple issues with that, the pH probe isn't like, designed to sit 24 hours a day, seven days a week in like 12 dKH solution, or 12 pH solution. Uh, and it falls out of calibration a lot. Um, and then pH just, you know, electrical conductivity is the better way to measure the saturation. Yeah, and I asked, uh, and at one point I asked Neptune about could you use uh, like a salinity probe in there? Because electrical conductivity is the right way to measure mm -hmm. the concentration. And they said it would just follow the meter. Yeah, uh, yeah so, it's just the, not the made, probe, yeah. Right? Uh, so I don't know. I will tell you this though. The reason that I like really liked stirs for a while is because way back in the day, uh, Aquamedic made a oh, yeah. big giant one. They had a little one that I never used. Uh, the, the problem with the little ones is even though they're stirring slow, if you pump water through it at any reasonable rate, the slurry ends up starting to come out the top and mm -hmm. then you're not getting consistent dose because sometimes it's lime water, sometimes it's slurry. And you really <laughs> never know. But with the big guy, so the Aquamedic had this really big one uh, and there's probably three gallons of water in there. I never had that problem. It, it would like, you know, the, the, 
water would make it up about halfway and then the slurry would separate. Mm -hmm. uh, it had a check valve in it. It had a stir bar that like, uh, for me, kept all the stuff stirring. It was strong enough to keep it going. Uh, the motor on the top wasn't really designed to last forever, but they were really easy to replace. You know, every couple of years, they weren't inexpensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, uh, it was the best solution. But the reality of it is, is nobody uses these stirrers, so I, I think they stopped making it. Yeah, I, uh, I haven't seen one for a while. And that's part of the reason why you don't see a lot of advancements in Kelk stirrers is because like, people just don't really ask for or, or buy them very yeah, often. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, in that spirit, with the, the stir bar, uh, the stir bars jam, they're hard to know when you need to add more. Like whenever it is, you know, depleted and it's just precipitated in the bottom, it's really hard to know uh, when that, that you need to add more media in it. And overall, man, the whole thing's gonna cost a lot more. I gotta buy all this gear. I gotta maintain the gear. Oh yeah. Uh, and if you dose too, too fast through it, uh, you can dose the slurry by accident. It's a total pain to clean, especially if it turns into rock on, on the bottom. And for me, man, like more can just go wrong with these things than right. Mm. Uh, well, wouldn't it suck to spend the two, three hundred bucks for a stirrer and then two years or a year later it just fails? Two months. <laughs> or two uh, months, uh, yeah. It wasn't, wasn't for me. Uh, so I, I think there's other people that will, you know, chime in and say they had a more positive experience. Yeah, I think uh, Reef Dudes, uh, I think Devin has, was using one of these too. Uh, but I think he's now on the slurry thing. If I remember so, right. I, what I'll say, man, is, you know, uh, often when people are asking these questions, they're not necessarily asking, you know, would, would you do it? They're, maybe they're asking, would you do it yourself? They're asking, you know, your opinion on it. And one of the things I'd share is, yeah, man, it absolutely can work. There's probably five people in the audience saying right mm -hmm. now that they use it and they love it. But what I would say to that is, it's a lower percentage success solution than other things, right? Uh, and by the way, this the is the more complexity you. This add is to coming it. from somebody that sells this stuff and would make a lot more money if you went and bought it. Mm. So, uh, like, there's like, uh, yeah, that's the thing with any anything in this hobby. The more complexity behind the application, the level of success for somebody who is hasn't like the more things that could go wrong the more requirement that you have to catch it yep, monitoring uh, and all kinds of stuff yeah yeah i don't know okay so this is where it gets interesting okay so that was like basically the conversation that was being had in 2015 mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh now well, fast forward there was ATO part of that conversation, but we haven't. ATO is kind of like that max saturation reservoir thing kinda, as well. Yeah. But uh, it's just that we didn't use a doser and use a, con a precise amount. But mm -hmm. uh, so now is the slurry conversation. I think this, from what I was reading, I think this kind of started to materialize 2006, 2008. Like, Kelfo was talking about it on Reef Central. I don't think it got chased down as far as it has today. No, they refined it. And it, people have brought up, you know, yeah. Gosey and Slurry. In fact, like, I remember even seeing, you know, the conversation. Because as a, as a, you know, reefer, my first answer is, well, why don't I want to dose that stuff in the bottom? And I've noticed when I do dose some stuff on the bottom by the accident, my pH goes up even more. Uh, and so I don't remember if I asked it personally or if I just read somebody. but. I, I, you know, I watched Randy Holmes finally answer the question. He's mm -hmm. like, you know, five different reasons why you wouldn't want to do this. Right, right, right. right. Uh, some of them I still agree with to some degree, and some of them I'm starting to open my mind to a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, and especially to the right person. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to pause this conversation right now because uh, – I don't know if Randy and I are the best possible person to listen to for dosing slurry. <laughs> we've never done it. I've never done it. No. Right? I do have enough background knowledge on all of the equipment involved and the chemicals used and how you'd use it to really grasp it pretty well. 
But I thought at this point, what the best thing to do would be to call Re Luca. Reach out to the pioneers who are doing it, yeah. yeah. So uh, Luca had actually uh, messaged me on uh, Instagram a while ago, and just for everybody's note, uh, that's a black hole. Uh, <laughs> if <laughs> your, I could turn it off, Your I would. Facebook Messenger and your Instagram yeah, are black like, holes. I, I don't use that thing. So, uh, but I actually went back and found it because somebody told me that uh, he had actually messaged me there. <laughs> found him, and I got on the phone call yesterday with him, and. I don't know if I call him the founder of Slurry because I mean people talk about it, but he has refined the process mm. to his specific needs, man, and shared a successful method mm -hmm. with the community on how to do this. So uh, better yet, let's go talk to man somebody that has put a lot of effort in this. And so some of what I'm going to share today is just our general knowledge on it. Some of it is also uh, some of the guidance that Lucas shared with, mm -hmm. with me yesterday. So, uh, so for the, 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 the fact of the matter is, if you dose slurry, basically with lime water, I can mix about two teaspoons into some water. It settles out its max, max potency. I can mm -hmm. mix it up again, but no more is going to go into the water. Yep. With slurry, what you're going to do is basically suspend all of uh, the little, you know, essentially the Kalkwasser powder in solution. Yeah. Keep it mixed up, keep it in solution. Keep it closed so that CO2 doesn't get in there and yeah, affect you, it. You know, again, yeah, put a lid on it and you, know, you, get, you get a little bit as the water goes down, but not appreciable. Mm -hmm. And when you dose it to the tank, the uh, calcium hydroxide that hasn't been dissolved. Reacts in the tank. Yeah, reacts in the tank will ionize in the tank, add calcium, uh, add hydroxide, which then pulls out the uh, uh, car carbon dioxide, forms carbon and alkalinity. So instead of creating the slurry in a vessel near your tank, you're essentially creating you know, lime water in the tank. Mm -hmm. now, the science of that might not be exactly perfect, but like you get the point here. We're mixing it up and dosing it into the tank. The tank reacts. It. Okay. Super high flow area and very slow dosing because the, the localized pH can cause it to precipitate. Yeah, you can make it a <clears throat> lot, lot stronger than two teaspoons. I think 25%, uh, I think, is what Lucas said is the max, the maximum that you can mix it to, but they are running it at like 2%. I got actually his hard numbers. Yeah. He tested a bunch of them nice. yesterday. Nice. So he, I asked him about teaspoons, and he's like, hey, dude, I don't deal with teaspoons. Cups. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, well, no, he said by weight, right? Oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. he's experimented with anywhere from uh, 2% all the way to 10% mm -hmm. uh, by weight. Meaning like if you uh, used, uh, I think a gallon of water is like eight pounds. Eight, eight some you know? pounds, yep. So if 10%, uh, you know, do the math and figure out how much, you know, you point eight, point eight to uh, of, uh, of Kalkwasser in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, by weight he's figured it out, but he's found that 4% is the right number. And I'll share a little reason as to why that is. Mm. But 4% uh, means this is way, 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 way more potent than 2%. Okay, so now who is this the best for? right uh, and this is what I came up with and uh, I, I think he generally agreed so I'm, I'm curious if he's in the audience here today but uh, you're super limited on space I mean I don't got like you know a giant vent bat of, can, uh, of uh, yeah. space or space for lime water I could do this in a five gallon bucket I got a super high demand tank meaning Evaporation ain't gonna be my problem. Or no, problem. yeah, because once uh, you know, once you this thing is this is so concentrated that uh, it's not like I have to dose uh, 1,500 mils of Kalkwasser just to get the one dKH bump. Uh, this is pr fractions of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so super high demand tank. Once all the pH benefits of uh, Kalkwasser, uh, and you know, for instance. Lucas tank, uh, I haven't seen it, but he told me that it's a thousand gallon tank that's like wall to wall well, he's SPS. Got, he's got a display and then in the back he's got other systems, I believe, all tied to one water okay. body of water. A thousand gallons yeah. of water? Mm -hmm. All right, so like, dude, it's gonna take a pretty considerable amount of Kalkwasser to raise the pH of a thousand gallons. Oh yeah, and if he yeah. was only doing max saturated uh, lime water, he'd he'd be well over Just his evaporation evaporation rate. Did the evaporation like dude he that if he had to raise the evaporation with all these fans and stuff, dude, it'd be a tropical rainforest. <laughs> yeah, so not a good solution. Yeah, so you got to think outside the box and try something new. Yep. All right. So uh, uh, 
It's also for advanced users mm. capable of understanding and managing long-term risks. Like this right? one really hits home to me because in you know in watching uh, Telegram and Luca and in watching Reef Dudes uh, Telegram and Luca, uh, Jim, sorry. Um, uh, the, one of the biggest things that stood out to me was uh, they all of them said at a minimum uh, pH monitor at a minimum, but they also use you know, uh, the director, the KH director, and the K, you know, these different alkalinity monitoring things, and they use those together the alkalinity monitoring, the pH, and uh, the uh, dosing pumps that you can adjust to really dial this thing in. So there's complexity, but they're advanced. Like they've gone down this rabbit hole before. That it's not like they're trying this for the first time. So that was like one of the first things Lucas shared with me is like, this is not for your average. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. It is not. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to risk mixing uh, the calc slurry if lime water is satisfactory for your tank. Right. It's adding all kinds of unnecessary risk and complexity to something that doesn't need it. Mm -hmm. It's when you're beyond that and it no longer works and you're looking for a different solution. And one of the things that I didn't really catch until later on the phone call is you know, in a high density tank, a thousand gallon tank, like two part is actually really expensive and has salinity problems, mm, yeah. right? Yeah, oh, very much so. Okay, and then, so what do you, I think, it, I think what he was running before was a calcium reactor. And what he really was trying to share to me was, this is an alternative to somebody who has super high demand on a giant tank to a calcium reactor which has its own issues with, you know, your dependence. Carbonic uh, acids. And a dosing, yeah. low pH solution mm -hmm. of the tank. Mm -hmm. uh, that the, uh, like, little coral bits have phosphate. And, Lots you know, of phosphate. And God no, knows what else is in no it. No trace elements other than, like, a handful of strontium and a couple, but, yeah. Yeah. So this is actually a replacement for a calcium reactor, which has all kinds of fail points. A calcium reactor video coming up. Uh, but has all kinds of fail points in it. So if we're talking about the number of fail points between calc slurry and the number of them between a calcium, calcium reactor, reactor, you can have this debate. Uh, it all depends on the amount of equipment. And, and one of the things we talked about actually was if you're going to do something, when it, like, when it, like I, I always thought it was funny, yeah, like when you go to uh, uh, a lot of the fish sites, you know, it says for advanced reefers only. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that doesn't really mean anything, man. Uh, it should say, this fish will not eat unless you do X, Y, and Z. You will never do this. <laughs> right? That I'll listen to, man. Advanced reefers only. Like uh, I might consider myself advanced. I don't know. Yeah. Is there, I didn't graduate from a class. You I, know? I like to think of myself <laughs> as advanced. But uh, would I like to think of myself as somebody who wants to hand feed this thing four times a day? No, I don't want to think about that. No. Uh, but So in this case, one of the things he shared with me was, you know, yeah, dude, there's a dosing pump. There's a right type of mixing pump. Mm -hmm. There is a right way to refill it. Mm -hmm. There is a right way to protect yourself from overdoses. And this only works on a long timeline if you do all of those things. If you're like, ah, I don't really need that pH controller. <laughs> ah, I'm gonna use a crappy dosing pump. Ah, yeah, like, I, I might drop a, uh, tunes in my mixing bucket to keep the slurry going, which will only last for so long. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it gets kind of dicey Every single time you say, it's, it's, it's like that recipe we talk about all the time. Like, ah, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. this, I can make the Toll House cookie, but like. Baking, so, eh, baking powder? Nah. I just skip the baking powder. I don't have that around. <laughs> you know, I don't feel like going to the store. It well, makes a pretty crappy cookie. It does, man, it does. <laughs> so in, in that spirit, you mm -hmm. know, it, I, I would say if you're going to do this, the first thing I'd do is go find Lucas Thread and I'd follow it precisely mm -hmm. if you want to see precise results, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because. Uh, one of the dangers here is you can do anything safely for a day, for a month, for a year. You have to be willing to. Yeah. Almost any solution, if you do it mediocre, will take you to 12, 24 months. It's like what happens from 36 to 100 months. When you become right? complacent and when you don't swap out your gear and maintain gear your gear. Gear is failing at that point. Yep, it's yep. wearing out, yeah. all those things. That's when the Probes potential aren't for being calibrated anymore. Maybe you turned off the alarms because they bugged you one day. Uh, you know, all kinds of different things happen. So it's 
doing it right means like not just doing it for 12, 24 months because it's actually at 12 to 24 months where the tank looks awesome. <laughs> Who wants it to die then? Yeah. I'd actually almost prefer that it died in the first six months, man. Just like get out and I don't have <laughs> to have the heartbreak uh, at, at 24. So doing it to make sure you go long term. So this is a couple of the notes that he, he said he shared with me. I wrote down. Okay. Uh, one is uh, not for your average ho hobbyist, man. You need to be attention to detail. Mm -hmm. You should have a really high ma uh, high uh, 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 consumption tank. Uh, Multiple and monitoring and controls. Monitors, controls. Uh, he suggested uh, the Camor, I think STMT wireless pump. Oh yeah. A, you know this is a three hundred and fifty dollar dosing pump that's super reliable and, and trustworthy, has replaceable wheels, not just replaceable uh, tubes, tubing. but the actual Heads. like drive mm -hmm. mechanism. Uh, he uh, suggested that, uh, you know, he tested between 2% and 10% total amount of Kelkwasser in the slurry. Uh, he uses four, that seems to be the sweet spot because it will wear out your pump past that. Mm. Uh, I asked him a couple of questions and he said basically, when you have a pump, you know, mix it up, and he does it in a uh, five-gallon bucket. It's a simple, uh, simple container, and I, and I like the container because it's round. It's real easy to get stuff get moving. Mm -hmm. You can aim the dosing pump kind of tilted at the bottom, and it'll just keep it like all swirly. Yeah. Uh, and so he said, though, make sure whatever you do, use a uh, pump that has a ceramic bearing and a ceramic rod in it. Otherwise, if one of them's metal, the material will overheat and be abrasive and destroy the whole thing. It won't last a, a matter of, I think he said hours, but it might have been days. <laughs> and like, it was hours to days, not weeks to months mm -hmm. or years. Like, so do the, uh, if I would follow the advice, and, and you have a suspended material in there that's in super high concentration. And so it is going to be abrasive. And if we're talking about heat, you know, you mentioned heat a few oh, yeah. times. Oh, yeah. Heat, heat is introduced. the result of abrasion. Yeah. Right? So uh, I would follow that guidance. Building sandpaper upon sandpaper and then rubbing together. Uh, also, uh, you want to dose it into really slow into a high flow area. So you're dosing that calc slurry to uh, uh, the tank. And you might think, oh, my sump is turning over super oh, yeah. fast. Dude, it's probably not, not turning over, enough. and you dump all that stuff in there. I mean, if you use your like average like bubble magus thing, and it's just spurting in there, it's probably no good. Turn it down to like 15 milliliters a minute or something, you know, pretty slow, and just kind of slowly dosing it in, into the tank is probably a better option. And one of the things we talked about was that you know today's reefers are really trending towards one to two turnover through in their, their sump, sump yeah. and be like slowing it way down. All I really need to do is heat the water, uh, you know, uh, uh, get the, you know, pull uh, uh, particulates out of the water. And if I do it two times an hour, man, that means like most of the water is going to pass through this thing 40 times a day. Yeah. Right. Like, and uh, we really don't have to get it through 10 times a day to be successful. So, but that changes if you're going to do uh, kind slurry. Of things different. So yeah. slurry, he suggested 5X turnover. Hmm. And one of the things we kind of agreed on is if you have a small sump with a fairly small area where you're dosing it in there 15 milliliters a minute, well, that's going to have a bigger impact than if you have a big giant sump. So if you have a small sump and you're going to do this, I, I think I'd probably shoot for something closer to 10 times turnover in yeah. the sump. Yeah. If you have a big giant sump, maybe five times turnover in the sump. And again, dosing it super slow well, uh, and that, is important. And uh, it kind of the same thing that we recommend with two part is you'll put power heads in the spot you're going to dose and blast and churn the water right there to get it to from localized hotspot pH. Super duper important if you're going to dose it this way, man, <laughs> is you have to dose it right into the intake of uh, a power head. Yeah. Well, and uh, Jim, uh, he does it in his overflow, he says, uh, which is working for him right now. Yeah, I don't, I, uh, it, it depends on the overflow and how you design it, but I, I don't see why that would be a bad, terrible idea. Something but fast. You're going to dose it something super duper fast, yep. really, really important. Yep. Overflow, I mean, I, I just tend to like think of why would something wouldn't work first, and so this doesn't mean it wouldn't work. But it overflows mixing air and water so rapidly, mm. I'd be a little concerned that I'm just going to end up depleting it with all the carbon 
carbon dioxide from the bubbles mm. mixing in there. It'd be like kind of like feeding it into your skimmer. You know, have excess carbon dioxide that I actually wanted to pull out of the tank, not from the air. Yeah, this might be nitpicky though. I, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. So again, I haven't done it. So uh, five-year plan, he says, or it will fail. So beyond this for a five-year plan? No, or like, like set the system design up. I mean, if you're doing this, if you're doing this slurry again, it means giant tank, super high consumption, right? I got an enormous amount of money invested in this. Oh yeah. Which means set this configuration up for uh, a five-year non-fail, meaning like I've got the right dosing pump, I've got the right pump to mix it, Backup I've probes. got the right alarms, I've got the right probes, I've got anti-siphon, you know, mm -hmm. just like, like the dosing pump isn't infallible. You know, these things can siphon and leak depending on the quality of ones. That's where you get the right one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Uh, and uh, the ceramic bushing and shaft. And so there's one other part to this that, like, this was an open dialogue, and I, I, I don't know the answer to this. And, and so the quality of the, uh, the kelk wash you're going to use. So when I was just using lime water, I still want to use the best stuff. I still don't want to breathe the poof, I, and it cost me an extra 80 cents a month. I, I, I'd use the pharma. But the impurities... But, well, settled out at the bottom, not, do not dosing that. Yeah, so even if I use the cheap stuff, though, if I'm doing lime water, the impurities go to the bottom. Mm -hmm. and if I use it in a slurry, the impurities are going in the tank. Now, there's some debate to be had, and the answer is anybody who says they know the answer to this question wholeheartedly and with 100% confidence, uh, it's just lying to you, man. It's not true. I, I am not representing this this way. And anybody who does, I'd like to know how you have identified mm. that to uh, uh, absolute confidence. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so what the belief is, is, you know, if I use the like Mississippi lime and I have the 22 hard hundred parts silica, from silica, I have all that aluminum, I have more arsenic, mm. I have all the 20, 22 parts per million uh, or 18, whatever it was, of heavy metals in there and all the other stuff I don't want. I'm dosing this to my tank. The thought process is it'll build up over time. Okay, well, yeah, like I don't want to intentionally dose that to the tank, but, you know, is it in a precipitate form because of the super high pH? Oh, yeah. pH and when I dose it to the tank, is it just going to settle out in the tank somewhere as Not some kind of aluminum, dormant. silica, yeah. Uh, yeah. precipitate, copper precipitate, or heavy metal precipitate mm -hmm. in, the, in the tank, and it won't really cause me any problems? Insoluble and just kind of sits there. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and there was like, there's various, you know, testing on this. Uh, like. Some of them indicated that the aluminum was actually a little bit higher than they thought, but they were like, the question is, does it matter? So this is the, what I, I shared with Luca from my opinion, is one of the guidance tools that I give a lot of reefers is, do it to the best you can within your budget because eventually you're gonna run into problems. You're eventually gonna run into RTN, uh, you're gonna run into a coral mortality, a fish mortality or whatever. And how confident can you point your finger at anything that you're doing in your tank? Dude, the more question marks you can remove out of your head, mm -hmm. the higher the likelihood that you'll find the right one. Right. And so in this case, if I were a betting man, I'd guess I'd, I'd go somewhere in the neighborhood of 50-50, whether or not all of that negative stuff would stay precipitate uh, and never enter a solution in the tank. But even if I can't measure it with ICP, I'll never really know that it isn't being sucked up into right. the organism because the corals and stuff will actually suck up the copper and it won't be necessarily available, mm -hmm. right? So I don't really know the answer to that question. And then, like a lot of people that have been doing this you know, successfully, yep. I've been doing it successfully for seven months, not seven years, mm -hmm. right? And so what happens if you have a bare bottom? Well, in a bare bottom, I bet you a lot of that precipitate ends up maybe in your skimmer, in your filter sock or whatever, or when your maintenance is clean. Kind of gets pulled out. What happens if I have a sand bed? And I don't mean like deep sand bed. I mean like you have an inch, which means somewhere it's three inches. Right. <laughs> uh, and this stuff is settling out and, you know, in that sand bed, it ends up being, you know, a uh, uh, low pH zone over time. Does that stuff break apart over time, go into the tank? 
The answer is who I don't knows. Know. Yeah. And how are you supposed to? And how are you supposed to know? Uh, mm. Yeah. There's. It, 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 there could be any, a myriad of reasons why like my arsenic level is up or my copper level is up. And our knee jerk reaction is to point to, you know, well, you know, like point to something like that. Well, it's gotta be the cogwasser or it's gotta be something, this and that. But you know, after five years, can you remember what you've all, everything you've done to the tank and when you've done it? And it's, uh, you know, if I'm, how long? How long can I live in uh, on McDonald's and look fine until later on I start to look like crap? Well, <laughs> I mean, it's going to take years to get there. Well, and so the question for me is like, okay, so is is all those impure? I mean, like, here's the thing: is we all like defend our areas, right? Mm -hmm. So, but like, if there was anything else, man, if like, if this wasn't something that uh, anybody happened to promote and it had all of those impurities in it and they actually was like on the opposite side of this conversation, mm. they'd say, no way would I dump that in my tank. I don't care. Like, yeah. I, I, it well, precipitate, doesn't participate. Like, why would I want to find out? Well, that's, a, you know, and that's when it becomes a choice. Uh, it, it's not a, it, it's, for me, it's not really a cost choice. What's the difference between a dollar twenty a month versus like 40 cents a month? You know, that 80 cents or whatever uh, is not make or break the bank. But, uh, you know, I can go back to our Kalkwasser Investigates video. I can see the very popular, all of the Mississippi Limes, Mrs. Wages, the three uh, aquarium brands and the farmer brand. And I can see like, okay, uh, which one has more or less of the heavy metals? Uh, and if it's a choice of 80 cents a month, and we know we're, we're not really sure that this could or could be affecting, I can just eliminate that decision and choose like a, better quality or higher quality or period. I mean, it, it's, it just goes back to the piece of do the best thing you can that fits inside of a reasonable budget. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, like yeah. if you have a thousand gallon tank and you're, you know, churning through a, you know, a kilo of this a day, <laughs> I don't think, you know, like pharma is probably the right solution. It's going to like, it's, it's going to house payment. It's cost, yeah. costly. But if I get a 50 pound bag, you know. Yeah, but if, if it's the difference of $5 and I sleep at night and I don't have to wonder if this is ever going to, you know, catch me uh, uh, unexpectedly in the butt, uh, the $5 is, I, 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 to me, it's just like logical. Mm. I, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I don't know why anybody would fight against this one, mm. I guess. It just, mm. in, unless it became a real cost issue where like, it just isn't affordable to do. I understand all the way. And we make gambles with our tanks based on affordability every day. Oh, yeah. We'll, light quality choices, Sol heater salts, choices, salt choices. ROTI. ROTI. Uh, we make cost benefit analysis every day mm -hmm. all over the tank. Mm -hmm. And so when you make them, it doesn't make you a bad reefer. But like, there are areas where some things may cost you 600 bucks more and there are other areas where it costs you, you like know, five bucks dollars. or uh, 80 cents. Yeah. I, well, those are the ones, man, it's just no brainer. To me. <laughs> like, just uh, rule that totally out of my mind. So uh, I, I think that's just a personal uh, opinion you guys can share, but uh, I, I will share again. So uh, slurry reservoir. I love the fact that we're challenging new thoughts, oh, this is really pushing cool. new ways. Yep. I kind of agree with the fact that this is about the same uh, uh, risk factor as mm -hmm. a calcium reactor in many ways. I, it uh, doesn't have, it actually has a pH boost instead of a pH negative. Doesn't have, it, especially if you use the right Kalkwasser, it doesn't have the impurities that uh, most of the calcium reactor medias may have. I think. Well right to right job in some ways. Well, I think, uh, you know, if, uh, because, you know, like both, you know, Luca and us and we agree that this is for advanced users, like the, you know, by the time I become an advanced user or ready to, or able to implement this safely, uh, I've already got things like my uh, aquarium controller. I've already got things like my uh, KH director or Triton. I've got these tools already that I'm using uh, that I can, more safely implement something like this down the road. Yeah, because I've already gone through this path of two-part and Kalkwasser and blah, 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 and this and that. Uh, so, you know, I like, I, I really like this. Uh, after, actually, after watching some YouTube videos and stuff, uh, I saw, like, there's a lot of innovation coming out of this conversation with the slurry. Like, I saw Rob B's uh, reef and the YouTube video he posts, I believe it's Rob B's, 
uh, where he developed this like inline manifold injector. So he doesn't have to worry about uh, dosing caulk slurry into a fast part or a really high churn area in the sump. It goes like through a return line, which automatically has high flow and gets kicked into the, into the uh, display. So there is one piece though, I'll share this. It's the Trailblazer piece, man. Oh yeah. The Trailblazers uh, find new lands. They are the thought leaders. They are the people that change the way we do things. They are also the first to get shot in the back, right? Uh, they're out in front of uh, the lines, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, my only concern about this conversation is the amount of newer reefers uh, or even intermediates on. are like, oh, this is for me. Yeah. And even the thought leaders, man, Luke is like, no, this is not for you. But <laughs> like, you know, as human beings, we, we take the pieces we want and we leave the rest. Yeah. I want to be a thought leader. I want to be a trailblazer. But dude, I got a tank with four frags in mm. it and a couple mushrooms. Man, this is not for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, like if lime water works, man, this is probably not for you. It's an unnecessary risk. Uh, uh, all the overdosing here, all the things that could go wrong with this. Oh, I'll share actually one more thing before I forgot. I didn't get this note in there. I asked him about the consistency, and this will actually lead into the next one, which is slurry in a reactor. Yeah. What about the consistency here is like, ah, when you get to the bottom of the bucket, well, now I'm going to have to like thoroughly clean this thing because mm. if I don't and leave all the residue down there, I'm going to end up with an inconsistent dose. And he actually shared uh, his solution to that, which is, nope, leave that thing alone. It's still got its little motor going around, mixing up a consistent batch, 4%. Go mix another batch that's 4% and then pour it into your existing one, and then you don't have to like clean it out all the time. And then like once a quarter, citric acid or something, the whole thing? I mean, probably, probably. periodically clean it out, but like if you mix up the 4% and pour it in there, you're just mixing 4% with 4%. Yeah. I don't know, seems like it would work. Mm. So uh, throw that out there. Okay, so slurry in a reactor. Yeah. Right, so uh, I have seen reactors out there that like they used to sell them with like maxi jets on the side and you're just like kind of constantly <laughs> and the way people would use it is you'd like set it up on the series of timers and you'd mix yep. it up and so it wouldn't be just mix it up let it draw out, then push your water then through it all these timers don't dose for three hours within last pump it's just crazy tough okay nobody ever used those yeah. things now you could, or you could use the ones with the little magnetic thing on the bottom and like, uh, you know, it really tr turns it into a vortex. Yep. Problem with the magnetic ones is the, they tend to not start up uh, with a lot of coke water on the bottom. Oh, yeah. So yeah they yeah. tend to not work. Sometimes they make a lot Might of noise in the racket mm -hmm. and stuff too. Uh, I also heard with all the calc slurry in there, they tend to, if they're running 24 7, they wear out the plate on the bottom and yeah. stuff. So, but here's <clears> the problem with that. So if I use the reactor, right? So in theory, man, I could keep this slurry, you know, in this reactor and then just dose through it. But the problem with the reactor is if I dose that slurry, basically I'm dosing the powder from the solution every single day into the tank. You're, you're losing concentration because you're feeding fresh RODI water into it and you're just replacing some of the water. So eventually the concentration kind of starts to decline. Dude, every single day, yeah. the potency of the solution inside that reactor and what it's going to dose and goes down. Now you're pulling levers and switches to try, you're like your alkalinity is fa falling, your pH isn't consistent, then you got to replenish it. And this, okay. so in, right next to the slurry reactor and doser, who this is for, it I says no one. I wrote no one. <laughs> this is the hard no for me. Yeah. Uh, and somebody might out there say otherwise. But so unstable. I think. I, yeah. Unpredictable, unstable. The heart of a good calcium, alkalinity, and pH solution is stability. Yeah. And if it isn't st stable, meaning like I don't know the concentration of the solution and it changes over time and I'm going to have to compensate for that, that's got a really tough five-year trajectory. There's way better options than it, that. I, I would personally rather run a lower pH tank than have that level <laughs> of complexity and risk. Now, I'm sure there's somebody out there that says, no, 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 no that's my favorite way. I don't know, man. For me, I, I, I just, I couldn't justify, I'd use the bucket, man. Everybody's got room for a five-gallon bucket next to the tank. Yeah. You know, yeah. why would I use this reactor it's the gear junkie piece or I don't know. And sometimes like 
if you bought something, you just feel the need to use it. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I've had that anyway. Oh yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know. Uh, so well, uh, these are hard to find too. Uh, when was the last time you saw a calc reactor? I don't know. You kind of would end up like making a DIY yeah. one or something. I don't know. Uh, so yeah. So the reactor again, if you're feeding new fresh water, and it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be done, but there are better ways. It dilutes potency every day, has the most to go wrong, uh, and there's tons of methods out there that provide a stable, consistent dose and chemistry and beats the pH benefit. Yeah. So of all of the ones we mentioned today, calcellary reactor, or, do, or yeah, reactor, not my favorite. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 there's not a single person on the planet that I would recommend that to. And if somebody told me they were going to do that and I cared yeah. about them and their reef, I would try to talk them out of it. I think the current slurry community would agree also that Excellent. they're not going to do this with a dose or with a reactor. All right. So uh, hopefully uh, we got some hard lessons here, uh, uh, but hopefully you got an idea of the four different ways. And one of them probably spoke to you. Uh, but again, uh, Kalkwas are the most unappreciated of it is. <laughs> so, hard lessons, 2022 uh, uh, versus 2015, what's number one? Uh, miss the dosing pump and reser reservoir. So this was back, uh, if you go watch, if you go watch that fit the week 30 in 52 weeks, I don't know if you ever mentioned mix this thing up to the max saturation, put a loose or put a uh, lid on it and dose with a dosing pump. Just wasn't, Dude, th wasn't there. It had just never been recommended me to do that way. And, and like Seems to the be whole the best hobby way. had gone from Kelkwasser to two part uh, at some point in time. And it's like <clears throat> bypassed it. Like nobody's thinking about Kelkwasser anymore. It was ATO or uh, nothing. No good reason. Yeah. Uh, or is ATO stir or nothing? Yeah. Okay. So ATO, I don't know, but like, it just, I don't know why, man. You just don't have a vat, a doser, and dose a stable, consistent supply of lime water. I, it Easy. is the right solution. I can control my pH, calcium, alkalinity, done. Uh, right. Hard lesson is we should have thought of that in 2015. <laughs> and I don't really think, I mean, there's probably some people raising their hand saying, that, oh, yeah, I we thought do of that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, I, don't, I just didn't see that happening anymore. Uh, so, nope. all right. Uh, another hard lesson we learned is um, why would you ever go less than max saturation? Uh, I toyed around with this one before when uh, I was making a 25 gallon brute trash can trying to figure out, okay, well, one teaspoon per gallon or should I do a teaspoon and a half per gallon instead of two because I don't need max saturation. I'm not even testing the solution to find out what saturation it is and just kind of blindly dumping teaspoons in. Uh, and in the end, it's like, if you need to go lower, you know, this, this kind of stemmed from the ATO conversation where, you know, I can't predict when my ATO is going to, you know, dose my thing. So if I need less alkalinity uh, and, and calcium concentration, I just make my, my solution and my ATO less potent. Well, now it's, uh, you know, with the reservoir and a dosing pump, it, there's no reason to not make it max saturation and then just dose what you need. Yeah, I think it was all stemmed to the ATO yeah, conversation. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, it's like, well, my ATO does this amount and it's, I can't change how much I evaporate that well, so I might as well make it less potent. Uh, I, but like then, I, that means I have to meticulously clean this thing each time or some of the residue from last time to yeah. make it more potent when I add it. So yeah. I, I would just skip the less potent entirely, make it the max two, two teaspoon mm -hmm. uh, uh, lime water yep. and then dose the right amount. Yeah, uh, for sure. End, end of story. Uh, okay, so, and the, I mean, we're gonna just kill it. With, I, I had <laughs> success with the auto top off, man. Like I really did. I just had that 10 gallon bin, the auto top off had kelp washer in it. I had a really solid mixed tank. I I don't know. I mean, I can't really tell you anything other than it overflowed because of the float valve and stuff. But I mean, it works, dude. It's I just though if if anybody was asking me, should I put kelp washer in my auto top off now to manage it that way? I'd say you could, but there's so many better ways, and a dosing pump the, is the right way. The amount you'll spend, because I, so I, I was running it with my Tunes oscillator, yeah, and each one of those Tunes pumps are 25 bucks. the last time I checked. 
uh, and I had to burn through two to, you know, while I was doing the caulk washer. That's you know, 50 bucks. 50 bucks, I can go get a, a 1.1 mil doser. I can go get a doser and uh, do this, you know, this slurry or the, or the max saturation in a reservoir. And you know, for the cost of replacing my pumps, and if my ATO pump went out, uh, how do I know? You know, because. So I start making noise and it stopped dosing very fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah. So for the for the cost of replacing your ATO pumps, uh, the low cost of a secondary container for this purpose, the lower cost, the low cost for dosing pumps these days, uh, there's no reason to go into your ATO anymore. No, I just. Just, just skip that piece. Yeah. Uh, uh, so another hard lesson is like, I don't know. I kept getting Kalkwasser shamed for the last decade, uh, uh, but I should have stood up to it and uh, promoted Kalkwasser harder, man. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know why people just didn't get it. I, in, especially, you know, the the people that push back on this the hardest with me mm. were what I would call some of the most experienced reefers. Man, these, these are the, the like 30 year reefers in many cases, uh, my mentors, and they're just, it, they look at Kalkwasser like it is some kind it's of dinosaur in, additive. Inferior additive, yeah. No, <laughs> that's, it, it, that's it's, still just, good. It, it's just not true. Uh, okay, and then the last hard lesson that I will tell you is price doesn't determine quality. Mm. I'd say almost all of, if, if I'm a betting man, and I absolutely am, yep. I would tell you that there's a good chance that every single one of those that has a picture and a fish on it actually has Mississippi lime in the middle of it. <laughs> uh, or something similar, man, because the data from our tests uh, say so. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that wraps up Kelkwasser 2022. What we know today, man, what matters most, uh, hard lessons. I'm excited to see the slurry take, keep going. Well, it'll be see interesting to see it. how, where this goes, man, where the trailblazers take it, uh, what type of, you know, when we get to the five year success points of it. Yeah. Uh, whether or not, uh, you know, we end up using Mississippi Lime, we use Pharma for it. And in that spirit, we're gonna leave you here. There's a little video here. It is Kalkwasser Purity. The, the investigates. Yeah. Investigate. This is the ICPMS testing that we did on Kalkwasser. It's got the charts. It's got all of the uh, impurities listed out in uh, how much there is. Even a cost per uh, use analysis where um, you'd be surprised at what's really expensive. It is super cheap. All right. Check see it you out. there.